During the 1950s, NATO faced a new threat from the Soviet Union. Western intelligence believed they were building a fleet of supersonic nuclear bombers that could fly higher and faster than anything NATO had, including its interceptors. The UK's response was to create a groundbreaking fighter that would not only outperform the Soviet threat, but would also be an ideal interceptor to equip the frontline NATO countries in Europe. But in a twist of fate worthy of any Cold War espionage novel, it will be brought down not only by the UK government, again, but also by some rather unfriendly competition from a rival aviation company. Curious droid. As the Cold War deepened after the Second World War, the Soviets made great strides in technology. They surprised the world, and in particular those in the West, when they exploded their first atomic bomb in 1949. And the surprises kept on coming with the launch of Sputnik on top of the world's first ICBM in 1957, and then the Myasashev M50 supersonic strategic bomber of 1959. Having seen the effectiveness of the mass bombing raids on Germany and Japan by the Allies in World War II, there was thought to be a need for a force of high-performance interceptors, as it was believed that the Soviets would use the Tupolev Tu-95 to use the same bombing techniques but with nuclear weapons against the West. With the frontline NATO countries like West Germany being so close to the Soviet aircraft based in East Germany, no more than a few minutes away, any fighters would need to go from runway to 50 to 60,000 feet in under three minutes, something which none of the NATO fighters could do at the time. As World War II came to an end, the Allies scoured Germany for secret weapons and the scientists and engineers that built them. The Americans rounded up most of the rocket scientists and took them back to the States to work on what would become the American ICBMs and ultimately the US space program. Several of the top German aircraft designers ended up in England, including Alexander Lippisch. Lippisch had designed the world's first rocket plane, the Messerschmitt ME-163 Comet, which was the fastest plane of the war, capable of over 1,100 km an hour in level flight and just short of Mach 1, and was designed to do hit-and-run attacks on Allied bombers. The problem with jet engines of the early 1950s was that they couldn't accelerate fast enough and were running out of power at high altitudes where the Soviet bombers would be. The British looked at a purely rocket-powered plane, like the Comet. This would have the acceleration. But whichever way they did it, they couldn't fit enough fuel capacity into the airframe to achieve the range desired. A rocket engine would also not provide the power to run the electrics and hydraulics to control the plane when it came back to land, making the first rocket planes effectively gliders when they ran out of fuel. The breakthrough came when they decided to use both types of engine in the same plane. A small jet engine for takeoff and landing, which would also power the rest of the systems, and a rocket motor for the high-speed acceleration. The job of building the prototype would be given to a company called Saunders Row, and the plane was called the SR-53. This was a small plane that would be as light as possible to give it the performance required. The SR-53 was also being developed at the same time as the first rumours of the Soviet supersonic bombers came out, and although the SR-53's performance was very good, it was still lacking in key areas, and one of those was finding its target. The new Soviet bombers, like the Myasashev M50, were designed to cruise at Mach 1.3 at 60,000 feet. Normally, ground radar would pick them up and relay the information along with their heading to the pilot of the interceptor, who would then head off to find the target. But because the Soviet bombers were so high and fast, it was very difficult for them to find them without some form of airborne interception or AI radar. The SR-53 was just too small to fit all the required radar electronics into it and keep the performance. So a new plane was planned called the SR-177. This would be a larger version of the SR-53 with a bigger, more powerful jet engine, AI radar and the same rocket motor. It would also be capable of mid-air refueling, allow it to stay in the air for much longer. This new mixed fuel aircraft with the onboard radar would have incredible interception capabilities, well beyond any other fighter of the time, 
and something that was exactly what the West German Luftwaffe were looking for to counter the Soviet threat from just across the border. The SR-177 was poised to become the new NATO fighter, which would be a huge contract for anyone who won it. However, at the same time, the British government was basically broke after the war and the cost of maintaining military spending at wartime levels was too much to bear. In the now infamous White Paper of 1957, the government put forward the idea of basically scrapping huge sections of the military infrastructure to concentrate on intercontinental ballistic missiles. This meant that the intercept projects like the SR-177 would be deemed obsolete and not ordered by the RAF. The English Electric Lightning would be the last interceptor ordered by the RAF to cover the time until surface-to-air missile technology had evolved enough to do the job. But this white paper didn't cover the Royal Navy, who saw the SR-177 as a good carrier aircraft and had a provisional order for 27, although only 9 would be supplied in the short term. Because of the German interest in the SR-177, it also made it a NATO project as well. The UK government applied for special NATO funding from the US to complete its development, but to the surprise of the British, the US refused the funding request, but the reason for this would soon become clear. During the Korean War, the Soviet MiG-15 was often in combat with the American F-86 Sabres, but there were many US pilots that felt the Sabres were inferior to the lighter and less complex MiG. Lockheed's chief designer, Clarence Kelly Johnson, seized on this information and went back to the US to come up with a simple yet high-performance plane that would become known as the F-104 Starfighter. Although initially welcomed by the USAF, problems with the F-104 soon became apparent. It had a short range, the small wings gave it a high stall speed and it couldn't carry much in the way of munitions, and it also lacked an all-weather radar system. In the end, it was dropped by the USAF in favour of a Convair F-106, which ironically had been designed by Alexander Lippisch designer of the Messerschmitt ME-163 Comet, who was now living and working in the US. Although Lockheed had lost its contract with the USAF, they saw an opportunity to sell it into the NATO air forces in Europe, and the first place they would try was West Germany. In order to meet the German requirements, Lockheed had to modify the plane substantially, including fitting wing-mounted fuel tanks and a new, heavier, more complicated all-weather radar. These plus other modifications made the F-104, which was already known to be a tricky plane to fly, even more difficult, especially for the less experienced pilots. Even though the SR-177 seemed ideally suited for the Luftwaffe needs, the contract for the new NATO interceptor went to the Lockheed F-104. This was the last straw for the SR-177, and with the loss of the NATO contract, the Royal Navy also pulled out, and the project was cancelled completely in 1959. The F-104 went on to be sold into many of the air forces around the world, including Germany, Japan, Canada, Italy, Belgium and Spain, but its safety record became a cause of great concern for many of those countries. Due to a change of use from a high-altitude interceptor to a ground attack plane, the very modifications the Germans required, such as the extra fuel tanks, made the F-104 difficult to control and unduly stressed the airframe causing metal fatigue. The radar was also more of a distraction than a help when flying low in hilly terrain and was blamed for crashes due to overburdening the crew with information at crucial moments. In the end, the Germans lost 262 F-104s to crashes, 30% of the entire fleet and killing 110 pilots. The Canadians fared even worse. They lost 46% of their fleet of 235 F-104s. It would be almost 20 years before it became apparent as to why the SR-177 lost the contract to be the NATO fighter. After the Watergate scandal and the renewed interest in the US into corruption, it was discovered that Lockheed had paid out some $22 million in bribes from the 1950s to the 1970s to foreign government officials in order to secure deals in particularly for the so-called 
deal of the century, the sale of the F-104 in Europe and Japan. And one wonders if this was the reason for the refusal of NATO cash for the development of the SR-177 to clear the way of any competition. The scandal nearly brought down Lockheed and the public and foreign outcry forced US President Jimmy Carter to bring in a new law banning US citizens and companies from bribing foreign government officials. Although the SR-177 was gone, there were still a couple of flying prototype SR-53s, and it was decided that they would be used like the X-15 in the US and launched from the back of a Valiant bomber to fly to the edge of space for research as part of the British space program. However, after the crash of one of the prototypes and the cancelling of the rest of the UK's space program, the remaining SR-53 ended up like so many of the other unfinished British aerospace projects in a museum. And as for the Soviet Myasashev M50 supersonic strategic bomber, well, only one was ever built, but it helped set off the West onto a wild goose chase in believing the Soviets had a huge fleet of them while the Soviets actually switched to making ICBMs. So maybe the British government was justified in doing the same in the 1957 white paper. So what do you think of the British rocket fighter and the underhand practice of Lockheed to get rid of the competition? Let me know in the comments. So it just remains for me to say thanks for watching and please subscribe, thumbs up and share.